Thank you for joining us this evening for the Artist Exchange, a group created by and for artists to share new work, ideas, resources, and opportunities monthly over a glass of wine or tea, if you prefer. I, I like to drink water. <laughs> Please let us know where you are from in the chat. Then grab your beverage and join us as we discover the work of two wonderful artists. I am Shelley Rugg, the Executive Director at Gallery Route One and co-producer of the Artist Exchange. For our presentation today, we ask that you please stay muted unless we ask you to unmute. For best viewing, select speaker view from the top right corner of the Zoom viewing screen. We want you to know that we are recording today's presentation for future viewing on our website and YouTube channel. Now, please join me in welcoming writer, co-producer and host of the Artist Exchange, Pamela Blotner, an East Bay artist whose sculpture and drawings reflect on our relationship to wildlife and environmental destruction. She has taught at several universities, including Tufts, the Universities of Maryland and San Francisco, and Pixar Animation Studios. In 2017, she was appointed a U.S. Arts Envoy to Burma. Please welcome Pamela Blotner. Thank you, Shelley. And it's now my, my great pleasure and honor to introduce our guests for the evening, who are not only Judy Shintani and Lorraine Bonner, two Bay Area artists whose work draws upon difficult personal and family experiences as lenses through which to explore universal and historical injustices. Now I'd like to go ahead and say welcome to our first guest. And that is, she is Lorraine Bonner. Can we hear about your journey, Lorraine? Oh yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. I want to thank um, Gallery Route One and Shelley and Pamela for inviting me to present here with Naomi. And I'm just going to hope that this works. Let me let me uh, let me elongate your um, your introduction. I I was a little bit too fast. Lorraine Bonner is both an artist and a physician. Much of her art focuses on memories of extreme sexual abuse in her childhood. She used clay to narrate, to create narratives of victim and perpetrator, as well as the larger political dimensions of violent exploitation. Her art also explores grief and rage, as well as climate change and the disintegration of the biosphere and the likelihood of human extinction. Let's try it again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela and Shelley and Gallery Route One. And thanks to everybody for coming. And I'm so glad to be presenting with Naomi. I'm going to start with what I believe is obvious, that we are now in the early stages of <clears throat> a mass extinction event. This graph, uh, which I stole from the uh, internet, shows uh, the line of development of the family of hominids from our earliest ancestors on the left to multiple species of the genus Homo on the right, including our own Homo sapiens indicated by the blue arrow. Several of these other, uh, other species have overlapped us and we carry fragments of their DNA and ours, but they have all gone extinct. 65 million years ago, an asteroid caused a mass extinction event, killing off most of the dinosaurs. Only the avian flying dinosaurs survived. They had been working out the problems of flight all along, wing shape and structure, muscle attachment, hollow bones, while Tyrannosaurus and his pals were just getting bigger. Like the fungi, the avians were ready to explode in numbers when the ecosystem cratered and became filled with the dead and the small. They evolved into our beloved birds. I'm here to talk about my art and the trajectory that has brought me to this point. I also began with an extinction event. About a half my lifetime ago, I began recovering memories of deeply suppressed childhood sexual abuse. 
The person I had been up to that time disappeared, went extinct, broke open into a new existence. Eventually, I found my way to art. In time, art led me to the study of perpetration, which is my word for the act of betrayal, which underlies the capacity of some people to exploit the vulnerable. I also use the term to refer to the violent domination inherent in all the isms and in the commodification and plundering of the world. I made a large series of these perpetrator pieces, ranging from the purely personal to the much more political. Dismantling is a riff on the famous line by Audre Lorde, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. These pieces were all made with a black clay known as obsidian, which I identified with myself, with all oppressed people and the living earth herself. The white clay, which the perpetrator demanded for itself. After some time showing this work, I began to notice that people were making the understandable but to my mind limited association of the black and white clays with socially defined so-called black and white people. As I considered this problem, I realized there were two issues, both of which I could address in my art. One problem was the reality of skin color, which is an analog continuous gradient from very, very dark to very, very light brown with tinges of red and yellow. The other problem was the enormous imbalance between the archetypes of black and white, which are meant to be equal and com complementary relationships with one another. I began investigating different clay bodies to find those which I could correspond to different col skin colors and develop ways of combining them. My goal, as I developed the multi-hued humanity and redemption of Black series, was to create pieces that anyone could walk up to and find their own skin color. At the same time, I wanted to restore the sacredness of Black, to free it from the associations with contamination and evil that have poisoned it for centuries in Euro-American cultures. Toward the end of 2021, I became open to the reality of our impending extinction. I had a vision of an endless array of coffins filled with the remains of our human existence, as well as elements of the natural world we have been destroying. I spent most of 2022 making and glazing 100 coffins, filling them with a variety of what we will lose. And it was pretty hard putting my kids' hair in one. Yeah. All three of us, really. According Accepting the prophecy of our extinction was a big psychic challenge. I watched the film Don't Look Up more than once. I recommend it to everyone. Gradually, I began to look at the connections between the personal and the political, particularly from the viewpoint of diversity. Persons faced with a terminal diagnosis respond in a variety of ways. Some vow to fight to the end. Some turn their face to the wall and give up. Some deny that anything at all is happening, and some enter hospice. There is a program sponsored by the folks at Spirit Rock based on the book by Stephen Levine called One Year to Live, in which participants are encouraged to deepen their connection with their life by consciously engaging with their mortality. Many people who enter hospice at an early point in their terminal progression have experiences of the larger spiritual quality of their life, a greater capacity for giving and receiving love, a non-judgmental acceptance of all the feelings, grief, anger, rage, fear, and joy that are part of our mortal life. 
There are additional pieces of the Earth and Hospice series that are still in process. And yet the meditation on the seminal issue of extinction is already yielding additional visions. What if, as with the dinosaurs, there are those among us who are the birds of tomorrow, the avian humans? What evolutionary advances will enable them to survive this extinction event? And what will their evolutionary expansion look like? <laughs> These are questions impossible to answer. The sculptural glimpses are still in the studio. This whole realm of thought was birthed by a new impulse to sketch, which is pretty unusual for a three-dimensional artist. And this is one of the ideas that visited me. This, of course, is only one of a number of possible post-extinction scenarios. It is more probable that we will, that none of us will make it. Genus Homo has only been around for a couple of million years, Homo sapiens for only a few hundred thousand. And the perpetrators appear to have stepped out of the web of interconnected life only in the last 10,000. The dinosaurs were evolving for hundreds of millions of years. They had a much longer runway than us. Perhaps our only hope is that even if we are gone, our art will somehow survive. And an archeologist from distant planets will someday visit and wonder about us. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. That was quite, gave us a lot of food for thought as well as, as food to look at. Thank you very much. And now at this point, I would like to hand this over, hand the mic and the journey map over to Naomi Shintani. Her art addresses two questions. What does the past mean to us today? And how does uncovering hidden stories help us shape a fair and inclusive future? Much of her art touches on the imprisonment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Her work brings to light memories, repressed emotions, and current feelings about this period in US history. It also depicts how this historical injustice touched her own family and how it relates to current times. Take it away, Naomi. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me today to speak with Lorraine. And Lorraine and I have known each other for a while, so it's extra special. And um, so I am um, excited to share about my art. And we can go to the first slide. Uh, I call myself the narrator of culture because I tell stories using whatever best expresses them, from augmented reality to traditional Japanese craft to performance or installation. Much of my work focuses on the Japanese American incarceration. Uh, next slide. Um, so why focus on this time in history? Um, next slide. My goals for creating art in this area are to investigate my family history and trauma, to explore my connections and feelings about it, to conduct a healing action and an activist action. Next slide. I had a memorable experience with my father. We went on a pilgrimage to Tui Lake where he was imprisoned for four years as a teenager. While we were there, another artist clued me in that a dilapidated Tui Lake barrack was about to be destroyed. It is, a, it is a building that had been moved to a pasture. The farmer allowed incarcerated people and descendants to collect the wood. So we followed a hand-drawn map on a paper napkin and found the building in the field. I walked through the dried we root weeds, gathering small pieces of wood in a plastic shopping bag. I heard some loud noises and I turned around. I was shocked to find my dad loudly and energetically ripping the boards off the barrack. It was the first time I had seen my mild-mannered 82-year-old father, 
expressed rage about the injustice he and his family endured for having the face of the enemy. I felt intimidated to create anything with the sacred historic wood that had such profound memories. Next slide. Well, after four years of procrastinating, this is what I finally created. I called the piece Pledge Allegiance. I was able to capture the trauma and justice of history in this simple yet powerful piece. I think it holds the power of my father's anger and sadness. Next slide. I was once called the Japanese American Ai Weiwei. I think it is because we both alter cultural treasures. The deconstructed kimono series consists of eight altered kimonos. Through a meditative cutting process, I removed the design of the textiles and placed the pieces in altars beneath them. The altars, oops, the alterations significant were significant to the loss of culture and language that many Sansei third generation Japanese Americans experienced after our parents and elders came out of the incarceration camps. After their traumatic imprisonment, their focus was assimilation and fitting in. The discarded kimonos were altered and transformed into shadows and light becoming ghostly souls. Next slide. Buto master uh, Hiroko Tamano collaborated on two performances with the deconstructed kimonos, one at Soma Arts and the other at Arc Gallery, both in San Francisco. They brought a whole new spirit to the work. Next slide. I also co conducted two cutting performances, one at Thatcher Gallery at USF and at Radiant Gallery. Some found it reminiscent of the Yoko Ono performance. Next slide. My most recent installation is Dream Refuge for Children Imprisoned. It was first exhibited at Triton Museum of Art in Santa Clara, and that was before COVID. And I was lucky enough to be able to exhibit it outside with a sound ritual and procession with Ellen Vip and Callan Nishimoto at Fort Mason as part of the San Francisco International Arts Festival. It has now been traveling since um, the COVID to uh, the Japanese American Museum of Oregon and the Wing Luke Museum in Seattle and currently is at Towson University in Baltimore. Next slide. A lot of things influenced me to broaden my focus. These two um, photos inspired me to include communities that I had experienced having their children imprisoned in America. The photo on the left is of Manzanar uh, incarceration camp, 1943, where people of Japanese descent were imprisoned. And the photo on the right is South Texas Residential Center, 2015. And this is where uh, mothers and children um, of, of Central American refugees uh, group were kept. And I was just shocked at how these two photos look so much alike. Next slide. Um, this is the installation at uh, the Triton Museum. Um, next slide. Um, and this also is a, a close-up of the um, Central American children. So my goal in uh, putting this together was to bring education, visibility, and empathy to different communities of incarcerated children that were restrained and unable to safely embrace their heritage due to racism, economic situations, war, social inequity and inequities and government incompetence. So I included Native American boarding school children and refugee ch kids along with the Japanese American children. So it was honoring and a healing installation. I wanted to make sure their stories were respected. Um, I interviewed and recorded their audio um, voices 
so that they could be heard along with uh, the viewing of the installation. I also included an altar where viewers could um, leave writings and prayers. Next slide. This is the altar. Next slide. Now I want to talk about a um, current, a, a permanent public exhibition at the San Bruno BART station. I was hired by uh, BART to curate the exhibition called Tan Fran Detention 1942, Resilience Behind Barbed Wire. So this detention center was, was uh, where the Tan Fran racetrack used to be. And uh, many of the people that were in prison there had to live in horse stables. So my job was to really um, determine the content, work with a, a writer and a, a, and a, um, a organizer who helped me source all the images for the exhibition. And I focus a lot on the importance of creativity and there were many artists at TAM France, so I wanted to bring their stories to light. Next slide. Um, next slide. These are some of the panels um, that were created. Next slide. And then we, uh, I've given quite a few um, talks there with pretty large audiences. Next slide. Lastly, I wanted to talk about Sansei Granddaughter's um, Journey Collective. Um, next slide. Um, we advocate for equity and justice for all today and into the future. And our unique uh, artistic expression re remembers and shares the legacy of historical injustice and connects them to, today, to today's social issues. So uh, the five of us include Sherry Arai DeBoer, Ellen Bipp, Reiko Fuji, Catherine, Kathy Fujioka, and myself. Um, next slide. Oops, I think this is my last slide actually. Um, through my art, I hope that we can receive lessons and opportunities to respond to injustice and true and personal stories can lead to empathy and connection. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Sure. That was very, lots of food for thought and very, very moving. Thank you. And now um, uh, we've moved to one of my favorite parts of the program, which is when our audience get to ask our artists questions about whatever they're thinking about, what they're wondering about, and the artists are allowed to ask each other questions. So please, um, you are welcome to do so. Mm -hmm. Well, if you I'm want, curious, sorry, I, I'm curious um, if the two of you noticed anything about each other's work that resonated for you. Um, well, I, I did talk to Lorraine a little bit after we did our dry run of, and I was taught, I was very taken by the idea of color and that that was something that she really worked with and, and pondered about how people would respond to the color in her work and, and how she uh, meant for people to respond. And then upon learning from uh, people's experiences, she uh, decided to take a bit of a different route. So I was really um, interested in, and, uh, in, in your experience with that, Lorraine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, that was um, that was definitely part of of the whole evolution of it of my um, you know my journey, my adventure with clay. It's it's interesting to me, you know, and when you were showing the the children uh, on the um, in the center part of the installation that, you know, you mentioned the Central American children and the um, native children and the Japanese children who have been, you know, taken from their communities. And I thought, you know, that, that 
that started with what they did to the Africans too, you know, and took yeah. the children away from their families all through the time of enslavement. And even now um, are taking children of African descent from their parents through the, um, the system. Um, and it, and just, you know, just the whole idea of, you know, we always want history to stop repeating itself. And yet it just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't, you know, and, um, you know, and that's why we're going extinct. I mean, it's just pretty simple. I mean, it, it just, I don't know. It, it, you know what I really also noticed about your work that I really groove on a lot. And, and I, I noticed it when we were going through them before the kimonos and the way that they were placed in such a way that there were shadows behind them that showed this the way the light went through the holes in the in the cloth in the fabric and and it was very ghostly and i had seen your um flag piece before but this was the first time that i noticed that there was also a shadow on the wall behind that mm -hmm. and the ghostliness of that i just love that i love that effect um you know, there's so many ghosts, you know, there's just so many ghosts. Yes. And I guess in some ways for me, um, the shadows and the light are, are sort of the colors or some of the colors in my work. Cause I really do, um, appreciate what's behind and what's before and what's happening now. And it's kind of adding those, that light and shadow sort of makes things uh kind of timeless in a way and i appreciate your your um your um history of the uh, african-american families and children also and it is it is such a hard um uh subject that that um people feel the need to take children away i mean they're they are part of the the enemy which makes it and or part of the the other that um are the innocent part and so that has always been so um uh, such an issue for me that i wanted to remind people of that could not been, have been a better time as well considering how much attention is now is now being given in this country and in canada for the, the um, indigenous children from both countries and them being stolen from their parents and being and having to deal with that memory. So it's very, it's very good that you have chosen this time. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to segue into, into something else. It interested me that you were called um, were called the Japanese Ai Weiwei. And the idea of deconstructing objects had you been a fan of his work or did that occur to you or was that completely new um well i had known about his work but i hadn't really um connected our work in that way and and um it was it was uh it was just interesting for me to to hear that I mean, I think, of course, it, it, I I really um, appreciate his work, and so I hadn't I hadn't thought of it for myself. But in some ways, yes. I mean, the the kimono is considered a sacred um, uh, icon of Japan. So uh, for me to <clears throat> to change it into something to transform it into something else is is a is a um, big step. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Kim. See, I see a question down here, Kim. Yes. I wonder if both uh, artists would talk a little bit about your um, audience reaction and um, uh, how, how that has played out for, for each of you, whether there's uh, been any specific times of censorship or um, just any comments you want to make about over the years, your audience reactions? I, I did get censor, censored 
twice actually. One time, um, the piece that I showed early on of studying the perpetrator where the person has their hand and the, the person of the black clay is holding the white hand. It was, uh, it was in a public place and um, it was a place where people were employed. And one of the employees didn't like the fact that the figure was female and you could just kind of barely see the beginnings of the breasts. And um, they didn't seem to mind the idea of this black figure looking at a white hand, but they didn't like the breasts. And so I had to get a little piece of cloth and wrap it around the, the I mean, it was a workplace. I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings while they're working. I mean, it's not like they have a choice. So it was okay with me, but that was a, that was the main thing. And then the whole reaction to, you know, somebody said to me, well, you know, black people have no agency and that the piece where the, the, where the multicolor hands are pulling the chains apart, the white chains apart of the black foot. And I said, you're not the color of that foot, you know? This is your color. I pointed to one of the colors in the hand. I said, we're all brown, you know? We're all trying to free black from white, you know, the, the archetype of black from the archetype of white. Um, I don't know how people, whether people have really gotten it about the multi-hued pieces. Um, I think I found myself explaining them a little too much for them to have really been effective as actually artwork that represented all of our colors, um, which was the only way I could think of. It, it was kind of like reducing torsos to that kind of conical shape so that I didn't have to deal with, well, was it male, was it female? If it had breasts, it was female. If it didn't, it was male. And so I just did away with that whole thing. But I don't, I don't know that, that people really ever got what the multi-hued images were about, except when I explained them. <clears throat> and a lot of people have trouble with the extinction work. They just don't even want to look at it. It's too much. Well, I'm going to jump in again and ask you something else, Lorraine. Mm -hmm. we, we've talked about making a, a certain extent. We mostly talked about ideas and history, which is wonderful. But um, clay has been a very important part of your work. Are you in entertaining at all, moving into another material other than the drawing? Well, I did in the late 90s. I also studied some stone carving with a local stone carver. And uh, every now and then, I have a lot of stones left from that time. And every now and then, I think about getting back into that. But the other material is interesting. You should ask me that because... The other material that I've thought about experimenting with is that I went to see a um, um, a show of work by uh, an, a Kenyan artist mm -hmm. named Wen Wengechi Mutu mm -hmm. um, at the one of those palaces in San Francisco, and she some of she did these jaw drop to the ground pieces in bronze that were just astonishing. But she also did these pieces that she described as being, when she said what the material was, it was soil, pulp, and glue, which to me sounded like paper mache and paper clay kind of got together and made a whole new material that was not fired, but was durable. And because mm -hmm. it wasn't fired, you could put other kinds of elements in it, like sticks and crystals and stuff like that. And it would have the strength of paper clay unfired and the endurance of paper mache. And it's it's in my mind to do some experiments with it because firing gets, you know, is electricity and it's expensive. And um, so, yeah, that, that's an area that, you know, in my spare time, I'm hoping to um, <laughs> to to explore. I noticed uh, Deborah had raised her hand. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Am I muted or am I open? You're good. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is a, a question for Lorraine. Something uh, I was thinking of it as a, a question about the creative process. I know I met Lorraine at a poetry workshop 
And so we were both writing poems. And I know that you write poems every so often now. And I was wondering about the impulse. What was the difference between the impulse to write and express yourself in writing, whether it's poetry or prose, as opposed to expressing in an object? You get what I mean? Yeah, I get you. I get you. You know, what makes you write a poem and what makes you make a statue? Uh, just kind of the way it comes in through wherever it comes from. You know, sometimes I see an image and I just try and make that. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes words come and I write them down. Sometimes the piece inspires a poem and I have a lot of poems that are connected to pieces. Mm -hmm. So I just... I try, I try to be as open as possible to whatever is sent to me and, yeah. and just be yeah. humble with gratitude in this. So thanks for the question. It's a, it's a puzzle. I wanted to, um, I wanted to address, uh, I can't remember who the person was asking about um, censorship and my work. Um, and I have uh, had a couple of experience um, with that. I, I met a, uh, United States flag expert hmm. who was very taken with my flag, but then uh, proceeded to tell me that I was hanging it incorrectly huh. and um, that I should flip it around. And since it was two sided, you know, that wouldn't be a big deal. And I, uh, you know, I thought about it and I was, and I told him, I said, you know, I hung it this way for a reason because the fact that it's hung incorrectly is part of the protest of what happened to my family and so I think it was kind of shocked because it was still wrong <laughs> so that was an interesting uh comment I I had from one uh person and uh um, my kimonos have had various different responses um and um I have to say that most of the people from Japan I've talked to have been pretty supportive of the, what I'm doing to um, to to transform the kimonos and and uh, they they em embraced it. I mean, the people that I've talked to about it. Um, and then, but I found that sometimes people that are not Japanese or Japanese American or are Japanese American are a little bit taken aback by what I, you know, what I've done. And, um, and that's fine. Cause I, I embrace any kind of reactions that I get to my work and, and every one of them is valid. But the one thing that I, my response is usually that um, these kimonos were discarded and were kept in a, in a trunk so now that they've become pieces of art, they're traveling all around the country in traveling shows and at the Presidio and the officers club. So in a way it's, um, they become uh, much more, um, I don't know, significant and visible than they were before. Mm. Uh, Terry? I actually had two questions. One is for Lorraine. Did I hear you correctly when you said some of your pieces are made from obsidian clay? Does that mean that you use bits of obsidian mixed into the clay? And then no, I can answer that very quickly. No. It okay. Is <laughs> and what's invented and it, it that's its name. Oh, okay. Okay. And then for Naomi, um, I can't remember what it was called, but you got a fellowship last year from the state of California. And I was just curious what you were using the uh, the grant for, what kind of research you're doing. Mm, that's a good question. Um, yes, I got a, a Cal a California Arts Council uh, grant from uh, in conjunction with San Mateo County uh, as a established um, arts fellow, and um, the, even though the the funds were, uh, they didn't require you to use them for anything in particular. I've been very thoughtful about using them in in different ways. One is I'm learning more um, different kinds of Japanese traditional hand handicrafts. Um, I just took a wood carving course. Um, I also uh, used um, 
uh, some of the funds to do some uh, traveling in relationship to uh, to um, my uh, furthering of my um, art art um, experiences. But also, I'm really uh, um, working on uh, bringing Japanese or actually all Asian um, heritage is to um, Half Moon Bay, where I'm from. And um, and a lot of that sort of got sparked by the um, Chinese um, farmer uh, farm um, workers being killed last year in in a shooting. And um, I realized that we didn't really have too much of a visibility or voice in in our town. And so I'm really working hard on bringing um, different uh, viewpoints and and uh, activities for Asian um, uh, Pacific American Heritage Month in May. Uh, so I'm uh, including uh, bringing poets and films and, and creating an art exhibit of Asian American um, artists. So that's been a big focus for me right now. Anyone else? Other thoughts? I, I have something. Oh, go ahead, Serena. I, I, I want to ask uh, Lorraine something, but go ahead. You're, you're, oh, you're on mute. OK. I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, I know the story of your father and how you went there, but also seeing that um, photo of how that looked somehow mm -hmm. and your description of how your father felt, you know, kind of just had so much rage that finally was released is really, um, and it was just very touching to hear that and to see the photo and kind of be there because um, because your flag, I just, I think that's such a um, powerful piece. You know, it's very, um, it should be in the Smithsonian because I've told you that before. I just think it really says a lot, you know? Mm. Yeah. And Lorraine, I liked your, um, when you mentioned that multi, multi-color thing and how you wanted everyone to be able to see themselves in it. I thought that was very wonderful, but um, I think, I may have seen your work before, and I, I think I wouldn't have real known what that was, like you said, that it doesn't come across, or or maybe you need to, um, I don't know, do you put it on, do you write about it, or put a little note on the side about that, when you exhibit? Yeah, in the, if it's possible in the context of whatever the exhibit is, I try to, yeah. Uh-huh, yeah, because that's a really hopeful thought, you know, of everyone being able to see themselves yeah yeah so that's all i want to say thank yeah. you thank you serena yeah so uh shelly do you think that we should keep the questions open or should we move on to talking about artist exchange and sharing opportunities um yeah we could it's it's the the flow is going along almost perfectly tonight and um unless anyone else has uh, any further questions or comments we could move into the next section well can i just say one thing to lorraine <clears throat> um lorraine i just uh really appreciate how we are both using art in a healing and healing way and i think also an educational way and um I see that we both are using our art to connect with other people and 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 to be inclusive in 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 many ways um, to tell our stories in a way that I don't think could be told in in other necessarily in, in other ways or have been told. So I just uh, I just so appreciate that we were both talking about our work together today. Oh, I feel the same way, Naomi. I'm so happy that we're working that we're showing together and. Um, I really appreciate you lifting up all of the injustices of the um, the Japanese American experience, and I love that picture of your father. I told you this. I just mm -hmm. just I just want to cheer for him. You know, it's yeah. that expression that that the finally coming out of the rage that he felt. You know, um, 
I feel a lot of rage myself, but very under the surface. It's really hard to get it anywhere near the surface. I mean, I, you know, I would love to find something like a shed that I could get apart. <laughs> <laughs> Your father did. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, thank you. I'm really glad we're working together also. <laughs> I want to thank you guys, Shelly and Pamela, for for bringing us together in this um, in this setting. It's it's uh, it's really a very beautiful thing that you guys have going on. I would encourage everyone to visit if you can get to Point Reyes, which is pretty beautiful in and of itself. Um, and you can visit Gallery Route One, which is a really large gallery. You know, for yes. it's, it's got lots of rooms and spaces. Yeah. Thanks, Lorraine. Yes, thank you. It's 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 a uh, it's it's a it's it's a a measure of love that we do this. We really enjoy doing it. We've done it for almost two years, and um, this gives me the opportunity to put in a little plug for May. We're we're working bi monthly, and uh, May fifteenth, which is another Wednesday evening, uh, we're going to hear from. Two, two artists, two filmmakers, um, both both uh, documentary and and uh, illustration. And one is Mimi Chakarova, and she has a company called Still I Rise, which gives opportunities to young filmmakers who want to start out. And and the other is um, is um, Cynthia Can, who is a Burmese artist who we work with in Yangon and who continues to work with, with Mimi. So please, we will advertise, but wanting you to know that that's coming up. And let's see, what else? Do you wanna take it away from here, Shelley? Sure, um, this part of the artist exchange is where we, um as a community of artists can share opportunities uh, for artists. Um, and these opportunities could be just sharing a show that you're gonna be in or a show that you saw that you think other people should really see. It could be a grant opportunity, a residency, things like that. Um, and so if anybody has something they'd like to share, this is the time to do that. Um, and I might take, Oh, go ahead, Mary Curtis. Okay. Um, I'm having a, a solo show at Mercury 20 Gallery. And it is all about birds. Excellent. This is a piece that I did in 1974. And over the last 50 years, I have been doing work, painting, drawing, collage, bar relief, all about birds. So it's kind of like taking a slice out of my career that has the same theme. And it opens, um, uh, Mercury 20 Gallery is in Oakland on 25th Street uh, at 475 25th. This show opens March 29th and it goes to uh, May 4th. Hmm. Great. So it's a it's a nice long show, and um, the reception will be Saturday, April sixth, from three to six p.m. And there are two of us showing this time, and we're going to be talking about our work at three thirty, starting at three thirty till about four o'clock. So I hope some of you can come, and um, especially. If you like birds, <laughs> thank you. Great. Thanks, Mary Thank you. Curtis. I, I put some of the details in the chat if Thank anybody you. wants to capture that. All uh, right. Part of the, uh, are they still having the uh, First Fridays, Oakland Murmur? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I think they're going to start again. They they stopped for the winter, but I, I'm not sure about that. Okay. But I would like to segue into okay. um, an interesting show that that um, might be very good to see. It opens this Saturday, two artists, 
one of whom has been with us on Artists Exchange, Jamie Trichy, and he's a painter. And his show is called Creatures of Duality. And this is this is for you, Curtis. The sculptor Gillian Garo has a show called Feathering. Mm -hmm. opening and gearbox gallery is in oakland 770 grand avenue oakland and you can find out about it through info at gearboxgallery.com thanks pamela do either of our um guests on the show today have something to share i could share for them who said that? Oh, <laughs> hi, this is, um, hi, this is Karen, Karen. Hi, welcome. And I'm yeah. Thank you. It's like I had a call that rolled in, but right now there is a show. I'm a curator, and that has both Naomi's and Lorraine's work. It's a gallery called Artworks Downtown in um, downtown San Rafael, and it's called Process, and it's just absolutely a, a gorgeous show. And they added so much to it. And but unfortunately, it's only up for a couple more days. But I'll put a um, something in the chat because then everyone you could see the online catalog in case you know because obviously it might be hard to get to San Rafael so quickly. Oof. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Uh, I also am going to be in a show in um, San Luis Obispo at the County Library. Um, which is, uh, hold on, I'm going to try, I, somehow I managed to get, I don't know how these things happen, but, all right, hold on, I'll make a copy of it here, and then I'm going to just see if I can get back to Zoom, there we are, okay, I'm going to put the uh, particulars in the, um, in the thing here, um, this is the sort of thing that you were asking, Deborah. It's an exhibit um, that's been curated by Shizue Siegel. Um, and it's, uh, there are gonna be panels with images of sculptures. My, my, what I'm presenting is images of my sculptures with poems uh, on the same panel underneath them. Oh, great. Um, yeah, so um, that's, uh, that's happening in San Luis Obispo and it starts uh, April 1st through 30th in the library and the address is in the chat. All right. And we have a share in the chat uh, vision of self through primarily supporting artists living in and near Yosemite is an international exhibit. And I fortunately have an image selected and that was posted by, is it Tongye? Mm -hmm. Tongye. Oh, oh there's another yeah. it's online. Okay. Yes. If you can find a link to pop in the chat, that'd be awesome. Oh, okay. Um, I, I wanted to mention something um, that Naomi and and I, and Reiko Fuji, and Lucien Kubo will be in a panel and a talk tomorrow um, at uh, four o'clock at the Watsonville Library. And we're part of a show called um, Never Again Is Now. And it's about uh, Japanese American women activists um, and the legacy of the mass incarceration. So um, that, that exhibit is, is up for, um, forgot when it's gonna end, but it's up for a few more weeks. But we will be, um, Naomi will be talking again and, and I will be there too. I think it's up till June twenty fourth. I think oh, so. It's it's a while. Yeah. yeah, a bit of time. Um, I I also wanted to just say again that I'm doing this uh an ex I'm curating an exhibition that's going to be in Half Moon Bay and it's called uh, We Are Present Asians with a uh, artists with Asian roots. It's going to open May eighteenth and it's going to go till um, June sixteenth. So. That'll be in half a bay in, in my studio. Mm, thank you. All right. Well, I'll jump in here and share a little bit about what's happening at Gallery Route One. Um, we have new exhibitions that are opening this Saturday. 
Um, our reception happens from three to five with artist talks starting at 3 p.m. And um, two of our artist members are showing. Uh, one in the center gallery is Ellen Vogel showing some mixed media works called Swallowing Sky. And in the small annex space is artist member Vakisa with her work called Vakisa's Love Supreme. And in our project space uh, gallery where we show the work of visiting our visiting artist program is Patty Trimble um, paintings and poetry um, called The History of Nature. So mm -hmm. if you can make it out to Point Reyes um, on Saturday, we'd love to have you. And um, we are always um, accepting proposals for exhibitions in our visiting artists program, featuring artists who work with the themes of the environmental crisis, humanity's effect on the planet, human rights, social justice, anti-racism, and immigration. So you can apply to that um, through our website anytime. And um, we still have space if anyone wants to be an artist member at the gallery. Um, March 31st is this quarter's deadline to apply. And I think that's that's pretty much it for the uh, gallery route one. Well, one one last thing, and that's that's for for artist exchange. If you're interested in presenting as an artist at a future um, artist exchange event, go ahead and send an email to me, Pamela Blotner at gmail.com. And if you were moved by today's presentation and want to support the work that Gallery Route One does to help people experience the world in new ways, then please visit our website and click donate at the top of the home page. Then select Community Outreach Donations and choose Artists Exchange from the drop-down menu. And I just popped a link in the chat in case anyone wants to go and uh, donate. We're always excited when we see a, an Artists Exchange donation. <laughs> of course we are, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Pamela, for sharing that. Um. Oh, and if you are not on the Gallery Route 1 email list and you would like to be, just drop your email address in the chat and we'll um, get you on our email list. And of course, thank you for coming. I noticed that there are several of you here who have who have appeared as, as, as um, artist exchange artists. Um, one one being uh, Lauren Elder, one being Kim Thoman. Uh, let's see, anybody else? Oh, Selma Arastu, um, Mary Curtis Radcliffe, and uh, Reiko Fuji. I think that's it. So we love seeing you. We love seeing you come back. And we would love to hear from those of you who haven't been with us. All right. Well, thanks again for coming, and we look forward to seeing y'all on the at the next next artist exchange on May fifteenth. So mark your calendar. <laughs>